So now we're finally going to take a look at elimination reactions here, and we're going to take a look at what I call the anatomy of an elimination reaction. And first and foremost, you should realize that an elimination reaction always forms a pi bond. So, and in this chapter specifically, that's going to be the pi bond of an alkene. We'll find out, you know, in future chapters we can form alkynes, or maybe even pi bonds that aren't necessarily between two carbons. But in this chapter, it's going to be all about forming the pi bond of an alkene. Uh, we take a look, so we've got two carbons. We can see that these are the two carbons that end up double bonded to each other in the product. So, and they both need to make room uh, so they can have that pi bond. And to make room, they both need to eliminate one of their other bonds. Now, one of them's gonna eliminate what's called a leaving group. We'll find out that the halides are pretty good leaving groups, so chlorine, bromine, iodine specifically. Uh, and the one that loses that leaving group, we call the alpha carbon. So, and then the carbons next to him would be called the beta carbons. So, and where the alpha carbon loses the leaving group, the beta carbons are going to lose a hydrogen. So, and that's going to be the job of the base in the reaction to take that hydrogen. So, it turns out you lose the leaving group on one carbon, an adjacent carbon loses a hydrogen, and because they both lost a bond, we now have room for a double bond between those two carbons. So, this is the anatomy of an elimination reaction, always losing a leaving group and a hydrogen from adjacent carbons, typically. Uh, we'll see that how this kind of plays out. There's two major mechanisms, E1 and E2, just like there was SN1 and SN2 for substitution reactions. Uh, we'll see there's parallels between SN1 and E1, there's parallels between SN2 and E2, and we're gonna, stay, uh, we're gonna start by taking a look at E2 elimination first. So E2 stands for elimination by molecular, just like SN2, the two stood for bimolecular. And the reason is, is that the base, in this case, that we're gonna be using, in this case, sodium hydroxide, so as well as our substrate, the alkyl halide, just like we had in SN2 reactions, they're both involved in the rate determining step, and therefore they both are gonna show up in the rate law. So specifically in this case, we'd have our alkyl halide as the substrate showing up in the rate law, and then we'd have NaOH as our base showing up in the rate law. First order with respect to both, second order overall rate law. So if we kind of see how this works, so we can break this up into mechanistic steps here. So it turns out we're gonna have a proton transfer reaction. So your base is gonna come and deprotonate the beta carbon. So, and then we're gonna form a pi bond. So hydrogen can only have one bond. So these electrons are freed up to form the pi bond between the alpha and beta carbons. But to avoid breaking the octet rule for this carbon right here, the leaving group also simultaneously leaves. So just like in an SN2 reaction where we had a concerted mechanism, in SN2 the nucleophile attacks and the leaving group leaves all at the same time. In this case, we're gonna have proton transfer, pi bond formation, and loss of a leaving group all at the same time, also a concerted mechanism. So this is a single step, this is your typical E2 reaction. Uh, if you notice, you double the concentration of the alkyl halide, the rate doubles. If you double the concentration of the base, the rate doubles. If you double the concentration of the alkyl halide and the base, the rate quadruples. So very comparable to what we saw with SN2 reactions. So the first thing we want to take a closer look at with regard to E2 reactions are the base effects. So just like with what we did with SN2 reaction, we looked at the nucleophile effects. Uh, in this case, for SN2, we saw that uh, because the nucleophile was involved in the rate determining step, we needed a strong nucleophile. Well, similarly here for E2, because the base is involved in the rate determining step, we need a strong base. And your typical strong bases are either going to be hydroxide here or what we're going to call alkoxide ions here. So alkoxide ions are the conjugate bases of alcohols. They're comparable in strength to hydroxide. So, and oftentimes we'll use like the sodium or potassium salts of either hydroxide or these alkoxides. So here we got sodium hydroxide, sodium methoxide, sodium ethoxide, and they're definitely your classic E2 strong bases. Now, not every strong base has a negative charge on oxygen or is either hydroxide or alkoxide, as we'll see, uh, but the most common ones we'll use in this chapter for sure are. So the second thing we're gonna take a look at for E2 reactions are substrate effects. And in this case, it's pretty simple. The more substituted alkyl halide is gonna be more reactive. And the idea is that the more substituted alkene is the more stable alkene. So if you start with a more substituted alkyl halide, you'll form a more, su more substituted alkene. And with it being lower energy, you'll actually have a lower activation energy leading to it as well. So a more substituted alkyl halide, in this case tertiaries, will be the most reactive, then secondaries, and then primaries. And then methyl halides don't do elimination. And, uh, there's no rocket science there. If you want to make a carbon-carbon double bond, you have to have at least two carbons, and methyl halides only have one. So uh, don't have to worry about methyl halides in E2 reactions in this case, but tertiary the most reactive, primary the least reactive in E2 reactions. So now we want to take a look at the regioselectivity of an E2 reaction. So 
This occurs if you have more than one beta carbon with hydrogen. So in this case, there's our alpha carbon with the leaving group. So, and right next to them, we have not just one beta carbon, but two. And one of them's primary, and the other one is, oh, let's try that again, tertiary. So, and it turns out we use what's called Zaitsev's rule, and it's spelled a couple different ways. A guy from Russia, it's kind of transliterated, so you see a couple different spellings. These are the two most common, but Zaitsev's rule um, basically just said that the more substitute alkene is typically going to be the major product. That was his observation. So, and the way he kind of phrased that, if we kind of take a look at the beta hydrogens, I've got one there. I've got three on this one. So, and he actually says if you use the beta carbon with the fewest hydrons, that'll lead to the major product. That was kind of his take on things. So, he said, therefore, with only one beta hydrogen here, we're going to use this one, we'll lose the leaving group, and so we'll form the double bond uh, for the major product between the alpha and the beta on the right. So, right there. And so, that's our Zaitsev product. It's the more substituted alkene. So, in this case, it's tri-substituted. Whereas the Hoffman product, we say, or sometimes the anti Zaitsev, you'll see Hoffman used a little more commonly. So that would be forming it on the other side between the alpha and the beta on the left. That is the less substituted alkene, it's only mono substituted, and it's purely driven by thermodynamics here, right? So your Zaitsev product being the more stable alkene, uh, being the more substituted alkene, I should say, is the more stable alkene, and that's what's behind Zaitsev's rule. But we'll definitely see a few exceptions to this. But uh, again, when you've got multiple beta carbons with hydrons, the more substituted alkene is the more stable alkene, and that's typically your major product as it would be here. So major versus minor.